us. Run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You know, the Bible abounds with what we could call figures of speech describing what living the Christian life entails and what it's all about. There's a lot of these all, all through uh, the Word of God. Uh, one of those is the word soldier. You know, when you think about a soldier, you think about someone in uniform, uh, you know, carrying out a, a duty that's been given unto him. Well, and the Bible tells us that the Christian life is kind of like being a soldier. Well, it is a soldier. As uh, a matter of fact, Paul told Timothy, uh, to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What he's talking about was a spiritual soldier, right? So, so it was uh, a figure of speech, something he could relate to. Uh, you know, the Christian life is like a family. The Bible talks about being born again. You know, those family traits of being uh, in a family. And we thank God uh, that we're in a family. We thank God if you're saved, you're in the family of God. If you're a member of one of His churches, you're, you have a church family and a family at home. Family's important. So is the Christian life. The Christian life is compared to a family. It's also compared to a flock. Where we understand where Christ is the shepherd, we are His sheep. That analogy is found several times in the Bible. He's the shepherd, we're the sheep. Well, in our text today, the figure of speech that is used basically is the figure of speech that Paul uses several times in his writing, and that is running a race. He used that, and I think quite often in Paul's missionary journeys as he's traveled, you know, throughout Europe, throughout Asian uh, parts that, you know, they had the Isthmian Games, they had what we could, you know, what we refer to today as Olympic Games, you know, but they had these all through the Greek Empire, and, and I really believe that as Paul was traveling that there were times he stopped and watched what he could of these games and stuff, and there's, he would take that, what people knew and where they are in life, and just compare that to the Christian life. In verse 1, he says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Can I tell you that the race, by the way, <laughs> if you're saved, God has signed you up for a race. You're in a race. You say, well, Brother Brian, I'm in no physical shape. Hey, I ain't either. I'm not talking about physically. You're in a spiritual race. Like it or not, there's a lane for you to run in. Everybody individually has their own race, has, has their own lane. There is a race that is set before you. And Paul says, let us run with patience, endurance, the race that is set before us. Now, when you think about this race, I don't want you to think about a 100-yard dash. I, I, I don't want you to think about a sprint. I want you to think about a marathon. Because that's what we're talking about. The Christian life is not a 50-yard dash. It's a lifelong marathon. And that's why he says you need to run with endurance. With patience. Because you need to settle in for the long haul. Okay? And, and, and you really need to, uh, to, to, to just take whatever he says here and apply it to the Christian life. Now, the, the great theme of the book of Hebrews is to encourage us to go on to maturity. Hebrews 6 1, verse 1 tells us that. Let us go on unto perfection or maturity. Let, in other words, don't be satisfied with where you are. That's one of the problems we have in Christianity today, with Christians today. It's just satisfied saints. <laughs> you know, people are just satisfied where they are. D don't want to know more, don't want to do more, just kind of locked in, settled in. You know, that's one of the worst places you can be in the Christian life. The Bible says you need to move on. There's always more to learn. There's always more to do and, and, and all of that. Let's move on. Let's live the Christian life to its fullest extent. You say, well, Brother Brian, how do you accomplish that? Well, I'm glad you asked, because we're going to look at that in our text this morning. Now, I want to share with you three principles on living life, the Christian life, to its fullest, okay? Uh, number one, it's something that we all need, and he just nails it right here in verse 1. Everybody here today, if you're, going to, if you're going to live the Christian life the way the Lord wants you to live it, if you're really going to be and do what God wants you to be and do, there is something that you need, I need, we all need, in the process of living this life and running this race, and that is encouragement. Can I hear amen? 
How many of you here today need encouragement? Raise your hand. Yeah, we're going to pray for y'all who didn't raise your hand. Right? Everybody needs encouragement. I, I, I'm going to tell you, there's a reason why the Bible gives us the story of Barnabas in the New Testament. When you read Barnabas, his name means son of consolation, which means son of encouragement. This man had a ministry of encouragement. He encouraged Paul. He encouraged wherever God sent him. He was sent there to be an encourager. I'm going to tell you there's power in the life of an encourager. God helped me to be an encourager in the Christian life. When someone's down, help me use me to lift them up. To, to speak something into them that, 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 that would help them along the way. Just simply to be an encouragement. And we all need an encourager. Look at verse 1. He says, wherefore? But, y'all, listen, don't overlook the words in your Bible. They're all there for a reason. All right. Now when he uses the word wherefore, he's taking you back to something that is already dealt with. That's chapter 11. Does anybody know anything about Hebrews chapter 11? It's called the great faith chapter in the Bible. That's where you have what we refer to as the heroes of the faith. And the Bible just mentions their name. He he talks about Moses and, and Sarah and David and all of these great men and women of God who, by the way, has already run their race. Okay? They've done everything in their time to the best of their ability. And today, they stand as an encouragement for all of us as you run your race. Notice how he deals with that. He says, wherefore, seeing we are all, we are also, are are compassed about, we're encamped, we're encircled about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Well, just look at the terminology he uses about these great men and women of the faith. You see, the picture here. Put it in your mind. The picture here is a stadium. Right? And back in the Greek times, it was a, it was a circular stadium. Right? And, and whether it was uh, uh, your, you know, your athletes or whatever, they were all in the center down there. And some of these big football stadiums you've ever been to just kind of wraps around. Right? That's what he's talking about here. Now, now, spiritually speaking, I want you to think about this. You and I are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. That, that's, a, that's a remarkable statement. Here's a stadium. A stadium where a race is going on. And the word wherefore ties us back to what he said in chapter 11. All the heroes and spiritual athletes of the Lord who completed their race in life. And by the way, they completed it successfully. They did it right. And their lives pleased the Lord. Now, were there troubles? Yes. Did they fail God at times? Yes. <laughs> hey, who doesn't? But yet, when you look at the totality of their life, they were faithful. And they today stand, <laughs> I won't so much say a spectator up there cheering you on, but as much of a fact that they're witnessing to you by their life. That's what this witness here is all about. Okay, We're encircled with a great cloud of witnesses. Now, you say, well, how does that encourage me? Well, by two reasons. Number one, we're encouraged by their experience. Why do you think the Bible is filled with all these stories? David and Goliath. Daniel and the lion's den. The three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. You say, oh, those are are kids' stories. Uh, Where do you get that? They're they're stories of great faith and a great God. Right. And and, and you know, the Bible's just full of all these stories, and and these are men and women that we can go back and and we can read their story. That's what we have. You see, the Bible is more than just an... Folks, listen, the Bible is not an outdated, archaic book. It is the living Word of God. Those stories are there to what? Encourage you in your life and in your ministry. You can look back and read the story and say, well, you know what? 
If they can serve God in their condition, what's my problem? Right? If they can do it with God's help, guess what? I can too. That's what they're... That's the encouragement. They've got the experience. They've already run their race successfully. They've already blazed the trail for the rest of us. Wow. Isn't that awesome? And here's what it says. If they can do it, we can do it. Would you agree? You say, yeah, but they don't, they don't have the culture of the government that we had. Have you not read your Bible? Can I tell you, we are, we've got it easy peasy compared to what some of these had. Right? Uh, I know we all like, you know, I don't want to get political and, and all that. Not that I'm against it. <laughs> but but, uh, but y'all listen, the, there were times where they had evil dictators and people that was in power that sought to kill the Christian. That, I mean, I, I mean don't, don't tell me, say, yeah, but they didn't. Listen, listen, they didn't even have social media. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have a library. All they had was pieces of parchment of Scripture. And they had God. And they did it. They didn't even have a completed Bible. We do. What's our problem? You see what I mean? That's what you learn. And, 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 and the writer of Hebrews is... Just, and if I say Paul... That's, just, that's who I believe wrote it, but anyway. Uh, hey, that, that ain't going to cost you nothing, okay? It don't matter. The writer of Hebrews says, Wherefore, you see all these witnesses up here. They're there in the grandstands of eternity. And, and their life is a path. It, it, it's, it's just, I can look at them and I can draw strength from their life and from their story. Right? Their experience. Matter of fact, look at chapter 11, verse 33. Can I just share something quick you, with you quickly right here? He's just going to include all the... A lot of them we don't even know. <laughs> a lot of them we do, but there's some we don't. Look at verse 33. He's talking about all these heroes of the faith who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Can you put a person in that picture? That was Daniel, wasn't it? Stopped the mouths of lions... Actually, it was God who stopped the mouths of lions, but Daniel was able to, to, to reap the benefits of that by faith. Look at verse 34. Quench the violence of fire. There's your three Hebrew children. Quench the violence of fire. Escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Wax, valiant, and fight. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead being raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel, mocking, scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder. By the way, that's Jeremiah. Uh, Jewish history says that he was cut in half by a saw for his faith. They were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And we could go on and on and on. In other words, every one of us can successfully live the Christian life because of their example and their encouragement. And when we look at our circumstances today, we say, this is hard. This is tough. I've got this to go back to. Say, so you know what? It was tough for them too. But they did it and so can you. Y'all, that's the purpose. That's why you got your Bible. That's why we need to get in it. Because I'm going to tell you, that's where your faith comes from. The more this Word, the more you get in this Word, the more this Word gets in you. And that's why Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's how you, that's how you feed the spiritual man that's in you. It's through the Word of God. And, and so there's a great encouragement. We see their experience. We also see their expertise. You, you see, these are not just these, these people that he's mentioning here. These are not just your normal, ordinary spectators. Okay? <laughs> These are witnesses that knows what it takes to be a winner. That's who, that's who they are. They're witnesses that knows what it takes 
to be a winner. You see, these are people that have paid the price. They've completed their race. They know what's involved. They know exactly what the rest of you are going through. And they're saying, keep on. You ain't seen nothing yet. Amen? Keep on. They know what you're going through. Let me ask you something. In a time of trouble, in a time of great despair, how does it make you feel to speak with someone who has been exactly where you've been in life? Exactly down that road. They've walked that lonely, dark path that you're going through. They've been there, they've done that, they got the t-shirt, and they've gone above beyond that, amen? I mean, they know it. And I'll tell you, when you're going through something and someone like that can walk into the situation and pour into you and share into you and say, keep going, keep moving, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. What does that do for you? It encourages you. And you see, all of these are just more than stories in a history book. These are great men and women of God. You see, they're not just witnesses of us, they are witnesses to us. That's what he's talking about here. He says, wherefore? Because of this. Because you see this great cloud of witnesses. (laughs) They encourage us to know that we can live for the Lord just like they lived for the Lord. So first of all, if you're going to live the Christian life to its fullest, you're going to need encouragement. And what better encouragement can you get than from God's people, from God's Word? Right? Seriously. That, that's, you need encouragement. A great encouragement. Secondly, not only do we see a great encouragement, but we see a great enlistment. Notice, notice the progression of this verse. Look what he says. He says, wherefore, that's where he starts, wherefore seeing that we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, then what does he say? Let us. There it is. There's your call this morning. You say, well, I'm needing something to kind of energize me to get me into it. Let us. There's your call. Because of them, let us. Right? That's what we all need. A great enlistment. Notice that phrase, let us. That phrase is used twice in one verse. Do you see that in verse 1? He says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Do you see that? That's important. Now, there's two ways you can live the Christian life. A lot of people are doing this. There's two ways you can live the Christian life. Number one, you can just wander around waiting to go to heaven. By the way, that's where a lot of people are. They're content. They're satisfied. I know where I'm going. And I'll just sit right here and do this till it comes. Listen, you, you can be one of those. You can sit around and wonder and wait to go to heaven, but can I tell you, you're not going to enjoy the Christian life very much that way. You're not going to get much out of the Christian life by that. I'm just going to tell you. Or you can be a winner. In other words, you, you, you can be one of these who, who's going to be everything God wants me to be. I know that we have but a short time before the Lord comes. You say, Brother Brian, they've been preaching that for 2,000 years. Yeah, they have. But folks, we're closer than any generation. He's coming and He's coming quick. Open your eyes. Look at the signs. Right? And if you're going to do anything for God, it needs to be done now. Not next week. Don't be one of these, well, I'll get committed, you you know, January. (laughs) Yeah, right. I've always wanted to do something. I, the, first work in, the first Sunday in February, I've wanted to preach on your resolutions you just made and just see if you keep them or not. Y'all, we, we can't keep them a week. Right? Good night. By the way, God's not concerned about resolutions. God's concerned about revolution. Something that totally, <laughs> it's revolutionary. Not resolutions. Hey, we break them all the time. But revolutions. It's something to change your life. You say, I need something to change my life, to get me out of the pit, to get me out of the rut. You know that's how it is sometimes in Christian life. Y'all, let's just be honest. We get in a rut. We get in a rut individually. We get in a rut corporately. 
as a church. It's easy to get in a rut. It's even easier to stay in a rut <laughs> once you get there. I don't want to be in a rut. I don't want to just, just continue on, right? Just do the same thing every old week, and, you know, hope people show up. No, no, that, that's, that's not what it's about. Well, I want you to notice this phrase right here, the, the, the let us. Uh, first of all, I want you to see the negative side of this. There's a negative and a positive in this verse. I want you to see the negative side of, of this. He says, let us, look at verse 1, lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. So do you see the first part of that, let us, the negative part, is lay aside the weight. Lay aside the sin, the besetting sin. The sin that so easily besets us. He says, if you're going to get out of the rut, if you're going to be everything God wants you to be, you're going to have to shed, you're going to have to shed the weights. Because this old world has got you in a mold. And it's got you chained down. The devil's got you chained down. Our flesh has you chained down. You see, he says, hey, you're going to have to get rid of the weight. Now, now think about this. In the context of what we're talking about, we're talking about a stadium, we're talking about athletes, we're talking about a race. Now, during training, they wear a lot of weights. They run with weights. But when it gets time for the race, what happens to the weights? They come off. Right? How many of you ever seen anybody out there on the Olympics with weights around their ankles running? No, that's training. That's not the race. Right? And they wear the skimpiest thing they can get away with. Amen? I thought I'd hear a bigger amen than that. But what I'm saying is, they don't want the additional weight. They're trying to... I mean, every little ounce means something. They've been training so hard for so long. And now the race is before them. And for the next two minutes, they have their two-minute spotlight for eight years of training. You see, there's a race set before us, y'all. He says, remove the weight. Get the baggage off. There's so many people that are just toting so much baggage today. This world, the devil, our flesh, that's all our enemy. And that's why the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Right? The devil's your enemy. He's trying everything he can. This old flesh has you tied down. He says, you've got to get rid of the weight, th those things that so easily beset us. In other words, that excessive weight. He says, you've got to lay it aside. You've got to put it down. You've got to put it down. You can't run a race if you have excess weight. Now, the weight he's talking about here is sin. Selfishness. Pride. All these things that hinder you in your Christian life. All these things the Bible says you should not have. Listen, listen carefully. Don't let anything, however good or enjoyable it might be, don't let anything keep you from competing successfully in the race of the Lord. Put it away. Well, I'm really dealing with this, Brother Brian. Deal with it. Shed it. Put it away. Right? Get rid of it. Don't, don't let anything hinder you. The, you know, the, the old tendency to sin as a Christian is still there, isn't it? It's still there. Sin keeps you from competing successfully for the Lord. So there's the negative side of let us. But there's also the positive side of let us. Once you get rid of those weights and get in a position where you need to be, look what he says. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You see, you know what that tells me? The Lord has a plan for your life. Right? The race that is set before you. Who did that? He did. He laid that out. The Lord has a race for you to run. He's got a lane for you to run in. He's got a purpose for your life. I'm telling you, people need to hear that today. We live in a culture today who don't think they have any purpose why they're even here, why they're born, I'm telling you, if you're here, you got purpose in your life. you got meaning. There's something He wants you to do. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a race that is set before you. And it doesn't matter what profession you are in life. What matters 
is, is, is do what God wants you to do to your very best. I think it was William Carey, years and years ago, missionary, <laughs> that was once asked the question, what did he do for a living? And he says, I'm a Christian. He says, but I cobble shoes to help pay the expenses. You see the way he looked, you see the way he looked, you know, if I was to ask somebody today, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a plumber, I'm a, I'm a lecturer. No, William Carey said, I'm a Christian. And this is what I do to help pay the expenses of that. that well, that's the way to look at the Christian life, isn't it? That, 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 that's a life that is lived with purpose. It doesn't matter what others may do. Yeah, but what about them, Brother Brian? What about, it doesn't matter what others may do or don't do. Make up your mind today that you're going to run the race that is set before you and do what he says right here. Run with obedience. Run with patience. Run with endurance. Remember now, that's the long haul. You're in it for the long haul. The Christian life is a marathon, not a sprint. So you need to determine now that you're not going to stop until you reach the finish line. That's what the great cloud of witnesses is telling you. <laughs> Boy, if you could hear their voices today, that's what they'd say. Oh, don't quit. Just go to the finish line. Wait till you get to the finish line. Can I tell you, it'll be worth it all. Somebody ought to write a song about that. Amen? Y'all, it'll be worth it all one day when you stand at that finish line and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Paul says, keep going, keep moving. Don't, don't, don't let any of this drag you down. So there's the great enlistment. And the enlistment is, let us. Because of this, let us. Right? Boy, we still need to hear that today. We need to heed that today. Let us. Then lastly, there's the great enablement. You say, you know what? I know it's God's will that He wants me to do this. I know I need to get more faithful. I know I need... I, 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 I. But I need a little bit more than encouragement, preacher. I need some enablement. Right? I need something to help me get up Put feet, on, put you know, prayers on, or feet onto my prayer. What kind of enable me? I'm glad you said that. Because look at verse two. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him. Oh, by the way, He had a race too, didn't He? Didn't He? And He ran it with what? Joy. You see that? Who for the joy? that was set before Him. Watch what He did with joy. He endured the cross with joy. He despised the shame with joy. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God with joy. Amen? Hmm. Verse 3, for consider Him. There it is. Consider Him. Not everybody else. Now he says, look to the great cloud of witnesses, but you need to consider Jesus. Looking and considering Jesus. Right? Now y'all, this will help you if you'll let it. If you'll listen, this will help you tremendously in your Christian life and in your Christian walk. We've been provided a divine enablement to make it possible for us to run successfully the Christian life. We do have enablement for us today. You say, what is it, Brother Brian? Looking unto Jesus. What does that mean? What it means literally is this. We are to look away from everything else and look to Jesus. Right? Look away from everything else and look to Jesus. In other words, you're to keep your eyes focused on Him as you run. Picture the Olympic runner. They're in the block, the starting block. Can you imagine what's going through their mind? Their head is down. And all of a sudden, their head comes up. And it's just like a blank stare on their face. The gun goes off. And I'm telling you, they come out of that starting block like a cannon. 
Now let me ask you something. As that runner is running, who is he or she looking to? Are they looking to the crowd? Well, no. What's going to happen when they do that? They're going to get passed. (laughs) Hey, you can't run and, and have your attention on... What is he saying? He says, you're in a race. I, I, I talked to an Olympic runner one time. And I asked him, what do you focus on when you run? He said, when my head comes up, I've got a spot as far as I can see. And I run to it. And he said, when I'm about to reach it, he said, my eyes go left, I find another spot. He said, I've always got a spot. He's, and he said, I said, do you see the crowd? He said, there's no one there. That, that's how you block everything you have to. As hard as that may be, you have to. And you've got to keep your mind and your eyes focused on the object ahead. Isn't it amazing? Over 2,000 years ago, the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. You want to know why people are dropping out of church and out of God's work? Can I tell you why? They don't have their eyes on Jesus. Y'all, I'm telling you, that's the number one reason why you drop out. You know and I know. People that ought to be here, should be here, used to be here. And I'm not condemning. What I'm saying is, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. Somehow, some way, along the way, they got their eyes off the goal. And they put their eyes on the wrong person or the wrong thing. And now they're out of God's work completely. They just walked off the track. Don't say it can't happen. Don't say it can't happen. Because it can. Right? A lot of people, and you, it's amazing what some excuses people use not to come to church. You know? Sometimes you just have to grit your teeth. You got to love them like Jesus does. Well, old brother so and so, he just, I didn't like the way old sister so. Listen, I don't hear, I'm not here to worship them. You hear me? Get above that. I'm here to worship Jesus. Right? Y'all, if we looked at one another, we're, my goodness alive, we'd always stay in a, well, I don't like the way they do that. I don't like what she had on. I don't like, I, it don't matter. Get your eyes off of that. Get your eyes on Jesus. And let me tell you something. When you put your eyes and you focus on Jesus, it's amazing how you can love everybody. It's amazing what things you can look over if you're focused on Him. Hey, what kind of place did he find you in? Hmm? Yeah. Before we go there and start laying it all, can I tell you what the Bible says? Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you at your worst. Thank God for that, amen? So, but listen, if, if when you use people as an excuse not to come to church then my, my, my only answer is I'm not here to worship them anyway. Don't let anybody... Hey, don't use people... Hey, they, they're, they're not the ones securing my eternity. They're not the ones who saved me. They're not the ones I'm going to have to answer to. Right? Good night. You don't use that excuse at work. You don't quit your job over that easy, do you? Well, so-and-so hurt my feelings. I'm just going to quit. Now, yeah, go ahead, bud. Go ahead. You don't jump up and quit when it comes to things like that. Why quit on God? Right? Good night. Mm. There's another sermon there we could go to, but we're not. We're, we're going to stay focused, right? We, hey, we've got to be focused, okay? All right. If you want to be a loser in the Christian life, let me tell you how. Get your eyes off Jesus. That's how you become a loser. Get your eyes off of Jesus. Notice he says, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. That's why you ought to keep your eyes on Jesus. He is the author and the finisher. Hey, He started you in the race, and guess who's going to be there to greet you when it's over? He is the author and the finisher of your faith. And He's with you every step of the moment, every moment of the way. Isn't it an amazing thing? This is the only book in the world, when you read it, that the author is there with you. Hmm. That's awesome. Right? And he promises, I'll never leave you. 
nor forsake you. And I promise you, I'll give you grace to handle whatever comes your way. Hmm. You don't get that from nobody else. You don't have friends like that today. Notice it says, consider him. By the way, he started the race, and he finished the race victoriously. He come out of that grave, y'all, three days later with the keys of death and hell. And he ascended to the right hand of the throne of God. He's there today at the right hand of God. Isn't that amazing? He's the one who gets you in the race. He's the one who's going to greet you when the race is over. And by the way, he did it all with joy. Hmm. A lot we can learn when we focus on Jesus, isn't it? You say, joy? How could, how could you have joy going to a cross? How could you have joy by being beaten? How can you, Listen, he didn't say he joyed in it. <laughs> His joy looked beyond it. What, was, what he was going to accomplish. Right? By the way, that's what you ought to do. How can I have joy in my situation? The Bible doesn't say have joy in your situation. It says have joy in Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord, not in your circumstance. You've got to look beyond it. Y'all listen, there's a better day coming. I may be sinking down here, but I'm telling you there's a better day coming. Right? I'm not going to have to worry about this. Well, set your mind on Jesus. That's what the word consider in verse 3 means. Set your mind on, contemplate on, think of Him. Consider Him. Consider him. Do you realize that just about any experience you can have, Jesus has already had? That's, that's the one who can relate to you. Really, what can you go through that he hadn't already been through? Hmm? The next time you are hurt, the next time you are criticized, the next time you are lied about, the next time you are mistreated, guess what? Consider him. That's what that means. Whatever you want to use as an excuse to get you out of the service of God, consider Him. Aren't you glad He didn't quit? Wow. Aren't you glad He went all the way to the finish line? There's an old saying, you probably know it. I just like it. Winners never quit. And quitters never win. I love it. I mean, I want to put it in bold letters in my office. And I want to look at it every day. Winners never quit. I just knew Alabama was going to lose that game yesterday. I was praying they'd lose that game yesterday. All the way to the end, I said, boys, they got you. Winners never quit. And when that happens, it's like, What can you say? <laughs> Quitters never win. You don't win if you quit. Right? We got a lot to, you know, we got a lot to work for and work toward. Jesus did not fail. He went straight to the goal. He went all the way to the cross. And, and when you and I are tempted to quit in the Christian life, just consider Him and don't give up. That's all He's saying. Consider me. And don't give up. You know, what's amazing about these great cloud of witnesses? <laughs> All these stories. When you go back and read some, you're going to find some where they wanted to quit. <laughs> My, Moses told God, basically, boy, when you read it, it is awesome. I, I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit of God just brought that out. <laughs> he basically told God, I didn't give birth to these people. These are your people. Lord, and if this is the way it's going to be, just kill me. You know? And I'm not saying it to be funny. That's where... Can you imagine trying to lead two million people? And all they're doing is murmuring and complaining? God, these are your people. You deal with them. I'm sick of it. That's where he was. That's the way it's going to be. Kill me. Hey, old Elijah was the same way. He ran and ran. Here comes Jezebel. There goes Elijah. He finally wound up under his juniper tree, his weeping tree, in the desert. 
And we all have one. <laughs> Don't we? We all have that little weeping tree. Our pity party place. And we go to it and Elijah said, Lord, I'm no better than my father's. Just kill me. Aren't you glad he didn't kill him? Aren't you glad he just worked patiently with him? Boy, I tell you, we serve a God who's so patient with you and me. He just keeps on working with you. He doesn't give up. You see, that's what great friends do. That's what he is. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I just want to encourage you today to keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Y'all, there's a lot that's happening in our world today that's frightening, scary. And can I tell you, this new year don't look like things are going to get better. And this may be, hey, we may encounter the worst things we've ever encountered in our life. But I'm going to tell you, you can get through it if you stay focused on Jesus. That's how. Not on one another, but Jesus. Let these stories encourage you. Let their life and example encourage you. But let it encourage you to stay focused on Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's why your Bible is so important. Don't let it collect dust on a shelf. That's God's Word to you in your circumstance. Read it. Live it. Love it. Just like He loves you. Let's stand together. Father in heaven, we come before you today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for a God who just doesn't give up. And Father, we ask forgiveness today where we fail you in our life. And I know there may be some today sitting here, Lord, that are just struggling. Maybe today is just the last straw. Whatever it may be, I pray that you just help them stay focused. And just remember, winners never quit. And quitters never win. Thank you for staying the course. Thank you for a son who stayed the course. And Father, I pray today that you'll help me stay the course in my life. Help me be an example to others. Even in the bad times, others can see Jesus in my life. Help us draw one, closer to one another in your love. In Jesus' name.